I think that in, in really important ways that, that my yoga practice has not just given me choice over what happens to my body and when, which it does, it, your, your yoga practice does give you choice, right? <clears throat> but I don't want that, like in, in, the, in the context of a yoga class, I don't want my need for a certain kind of agency to stop me from being able to follow instructions from a yoga teacher, right? Or to mentally mediate everything as a choice, right? Because I know that wisdom from body to mind doesn't travel through the mind first. Something else occurs. So feel your feet in your sitting bones. So right now, find your own position, right? I'm in front of my computer on my desk. I'm leaning slightly forward, right? I can't feel in the way that the rest of the world feels or people that don't have a spinal cord injury. I can't feel my feet on the pedals, right? Um, but I can locate my feet, not just with my imagination, not just through physical sensation. I've done enough yoga to know that I hum. And it's located below my head, in my spine, and through my feet. Right? So I'm slightly leaned forward because that helps me feel the sitting bones, the front edge of the sitting bones more. I've got my forearms on the table grounding using my bones. I play with different positions with my fingers, right? But I'm gonna this time do headstand fingers, if you can. It doesn't matter if it's like this or like this, but I'm doing this because the relationship between how this goes together and the forearms, is really important in headstand, right? So I've got a forward leaning momentum. I've got my hands, whether they're interlocked, fingers interlocked or not, right, happening. I've got more attention on my forearms because this part of headstand, right there, the meaty part, being able to make this be more open is actually really important for going upside down, right? And then I'm gonna slightly lift my chest, drop my shoulder blades. So rather than doing a typical centering, I'm doing a different centering. Why? Because with my own body, I get to choose. So every time I teach centering one way, you, of course, get to center however you want, except I would err on the side of listening to your teacher more than not. Be honest with yourself. Sometimes you need to do it how you need to do it. Sometimes you're okay doing it in a way you don't want. That's an integral part of yogic transformation is that even when you're listening to instructions a particular way and including your body, that doesn't mean you've given up agency, right? Don't give up too much power to your teacher, but don't not listen to him or her either. Decide, right? So I'm forward, I'm grounding, and I know I'm going to travel inward in this yoga practice. So I'm preparing. Now my hands could be down flat in this one, I could have my palms down, I could be doing whatever the hell, right? Because the sensation, this is the integral to the approach of mind-body solutions. The sensation matters than the physical manifestation. Agency. I know what it is to be grounded because I've practiced. Sometimes I'll do it the way the teacher instructs. Sometimes I won't. Especially with the freedom of being online. In class, it's harder to do in person. 
but I want there to be a grounding and I want the grounding of my forearms and the sensation and hum in my sitting bones and the bottoms of my feet to merge together. I want to lift my chest slightly, slightly extend my spine because space in the spine matters. I know that from my practice, and I hope you figured that out too, that too much we're compress compressing the vertebrae in our backs. So in this centering, rather than having it be this more meditative thing, I'm wanting to include a little bit more action Now, lift together, T slightly apart. Now, I'm going to merge with the room and stay in my body. My agency allows both. My practice reveals the possibility of both. My mind would never know I could be in my body and integrate with empty space at the same time, not without practice. This world was, is shown to me by my body, not my mind, this possibility. I can be both. My nervous system is both. Breathe. Let go of your day, soften the inside of your mouth. Prepare your mind to continue traveling into what you are. There's a sensation of you before everything else. Find it in this structure as well as other structures. Good, and then just because I know variation is one of the keys to yoga, to asana, because what yo, what, what the variation of asana shows me is that a core of me persists in every position, and it's not just psychological, it's sensational, and includes my body, so I'm going to do this. I don't care how you change it, change your position, so I'm off my forearms and onto my elbows. Right? I'm going to do it with palms. It doesn't mean if you can't bring your hands together like this, do it a different way. Find variation and then find the unchanging dimension of you again. And I've been doing this a lot lately because I've been learning a lot from a bone connection here. So I've been doing it in so many classes. So it's like, holy cow, I missed how cool that was, right? And then when I feel the pressure between my hands, how do I open the skin? Taught a whole bunch of crap about this. And as I open the skin in my palms, can I open the center of my chest? Can I try to lengthen whether it's physically happening or not? my sensation of my fingers, open my chest, ground my elbows, drop my shoulder blades. And then as I open my chest and my palms, can I raise the outside of my mouth up towards my ears? And remember the homework from last week, right? And the answer is damn straight. I can be incredibly focused and smile. I can actually not have the intensity of concentration furrow my brow. If I practice, remember focus and concentration is one of the limbs of yoga. And I want it to include my body. 
I really want that. I want my focus and my body and my mind to be part of what focus is. Again, from here now, let go of your day and prepare your mind to do yoga. I'm starting to smile because I'm getting excited. Good thing about age is you start getting to this place of focus through surrender and not just through will. You get to this place through surrender, not just through trying to prove yourself to people. Good, and then release. What the hell is this rave about? All right. Agency choice where my practice actually empowers me right so movement once he came here for movement right so dang i'm going to change how my spine is positioned within gravity <laughs> i wrote this weird line to a couple of people so i'm getting big here i'm just like going around the the very outer edges of the whole compass right Right, so the compass is the top of my head, it's my arms. Right? I was actually like, when I'm coming forward and back, so I'm just moving some, right? But <clears throat> I was trying to communicate to Kevin something about yoga that he hasn't practiced is that I think that the subtle, and I'm going side to side, the subtle energy in the spine actually lives in zero gravity, right? <clears throat> Right, that level of human dynamic and sensation. Actually, somehow the nervous system at its core doesn't have, is not as, as affected by gravity, right? Which is part of what you're learning in an inversion, right? <clears throat> So now I'm going to back up and I want my legs. My legs are being cranky from the weekend. I've been thinking way too hard. So I'm just going to, just like I want to move my arms, I want to move my legs in more spaces. So I want my muscles to get unused to the pattern that they've been living in too much this week. Right? I've been doing a lot of thinking and a lot of writing. Right? So I'm just trying to switch the pattern. Because there are things that my mind needs to concentrate. It needs less distraction from the body in order to mentally concentrate, right? But what if focus also goes from body to mind? And that when it includes the body, there's a sense of freedom and lightness, right? That's on one side to side here. There's a freedom and lightness that comes from body to mind, when my body is not kept in a cage, right? That there's a freedom of movement that comes from movement. My mind wants to narrow everything down to concentrate. My body needs to open everything up in order to concentrate. So I'm not coming forward into some version of dog pose again. Because again, I know, I know a space I compress way too much is my low back, is my, is my spine there. So I also asked Kevin a question about, about, do you think the body has imagination? Right? I do. What the hell would body imagination look like? Right? What would it feel like? Because I've, I for years and years, I'm going back again, a little bit of a back bend. I'm just like warming up. This is cracking my knuckles before I play the piano that is my mind body relationship, right? I'm just trying to make a lightning space, lightning, lighter space 
I'm letting the space in my body connote freedom to my mind, right? Not what I can do. I just got a big box delivered and I freaking can't lift it up. It's outside my front door, right? And it's freaking snowing here and it's cold. So I've got all these things where, damn it, I don't, I don't feel like I have choice here all the way, right? Was it last, did I tell you about getting stuck out on my deck on sheer ice? in my boxers at midnight. Yeah, I couldn't get, and the threshold, right, of the doorway was a, you know, is a little bit high, and I couldn't get any traction on my wheels in order to pop a wheelie to get the front wheels up. So even if I could reach inside the door frame, I couldn't pull myself forward because there's no way to straight force go over something that high. So I'm out there thinking, what the hell am I gonna do? I'm in my boxers. I do have a sweatshirt on, thank God. I had my cell phone, smart, right? So I had all that going on, and I, but I couldn't. I sat out there for six, seven minutes. Not, it's sheer ice. And then I finally, I tried throwing snow down to get some more traction, trying to use it like sand, right? That doesn't work. Then I realized, oh, I can actually take off my sweatshirt put it on the ground over the ice, roll my wheels onto the ice, get enough traction to pop a wheelie and get inside. And this, I live alone, so this was a silent happening between me and the universe, right? That was like, holy cow. And I got backup plans now. Like if I had to, even though my shoulders... I can't get up from the floor. I think I could get out of my wheelchair, get inside and not freeze to death and, and live to, you know, survive to live another day, figure out that later, get back in my wheelchair, like all these things. You know what saved me? The eight level of agency that saved me in that is pausing and thinking about possibilities. My mind focused because I wasn't freaking out. I was going to freeze to death in Minnesota right? So my body's presence allowed my mind to think of an option. Agency, creativity, right? All these things, big again. Uh, so does the body have imagination? Hmm. Forward again. Now I'm ready for dog pose. I'm going to ground down my hands, lift my sternum up, Drop my shoulder blades. Find my sitting bones. Work the underside of my arms. So as the under, I'm on my hands are on the table. As the underside of my arms goes up and I lengthen, I drop my shoulder blades down and lift my sternum up. To do this, that's how I find where my sitting bones are. And then I have to surrender in my body to where the bottoms of my feet are. I don't get to get there through action. My agency does not depend on physical action. I find where I am differently than control. And I breathe. And I love that exhale because I extend my sitting bones in my spine on the exhale. I open and expand on inhale. This level of agency has nothing to do with the big package outside that thwarts my will. Am I, and then back up, am I any more of a person if I can't get that packaging, right? Am I less of a person? I don't know. Life would be simpler, right? So going back and forth, taking up space.
Because right. we're preparing for headstand, right? So this whole class is going to be about headstand. So <clears throat> I'm going to take my legs wide again. So because remember, I'm trying to lighten my space by expanding the arc or domain within which my body has been living this weekend. So my groins are really tight right now. So I'm backing up here. I've got my legs wide and I'm making sure my knees are getting apart, right? So I'm, I'm making sure that happens. Now I'm gonna push and pull. I'm gonna push down on, on my leg with my forearm, right? With my hand on the back hip. And I'm gonna move in the opposite direction and I'm gonna lift my spine, right? So it's not just my chest. So I'm going down and up. And I'm learning the inside of an inversion, right? I'm going down and up. Remember, I'm gonna have downward pressure if I were upside down on my forearms. I'm gonna be rising through my feet towards the ceiling and headstand. So this like different versions of down and up, I'm practicing in every pose. So I've thought a lot about why I heard a very advanced yoga teacher say, shoulder stand is the queen of all yoga poses and headstands the king of all yoga. And if he, if he could only do two poses the rest of his life, it would be headstand and shoulder stand. So I've been noodling on that for years. So the down and the up are the foundation of every yoga pose. Bringing my legs back together. I'm going to lengthen my spine again. Because in both headstand and shoulder stand, especially headstand, I'm coming up on my elbows now, right? <clears throat> Doing this. So I've got my elbows down on the table, right? And I'm doing some version of interlap my hands. Could be like this, could be like that, right? So I'm like making so the down and the up, <clears throat> right? But here I'm lengthening and getting my base different, right? So I'm making sure my elbows are part of my base, right? And now I'm gonna have this reference of my elbows on the table, right? And I'm gonna make sure that I'm activating the undersides here, right? This is all dolphin pose can be a preparation for headstand, right? But I'm gonna make sure that as I have reference on the bones of my elbows, that I learn how to do a couple of things, drop my shoulder blades. It's not just drop, it's dropping them and bringing them forward, forward, okay? Because that's happening in headstand and when I get that triangle between the center of my chest and where my elbows are hitting the table, right? So those of you that aren't leaning pretty far forward to touch the table, back up a little bit from the table, don't fall, but get farther forward because then you're starting to get into the plane that's going to be headstand, right? So I've got my elbows and my hands. I've got my chest lifted. I've got my shoulder blades dropping. All these actions need to show me how to hit down through my sitting bones, right? So my, my chest is lifting, my shoulder blades are dropping, my elbows and my hands create a triangle that allow me to hit the energy down through my sitting bones. And now I'm gonna do something wild. I'm gonna lengthen the top of my head up, 
Because if I compress my neck, I collapse all the energy that actually is not as, it lives at zero gravity. Good, and then release. I just said a whole bunch right there, okay? I mean, we're gonna do it again, right? But if you, everyone just like put your head on your, your hand on your head, right? And push down like kind of hard. And think about, and like notice if you scrunch your neck and to exaggerate, you can take your elbows up, right? Your shoulders up, pardon me, right? This is what we do. This is a pain behavior. So I got my hand on my, my hand on my head, my shoulders are going up. Are you more or less connected to the space around you? When you're in this like weird, your, your sternums are up, think about it. You're not able to be, I'm just doing one at a time here, right? I'm shortening my neck. I'm dropping my chest. I'm putting my shoulders up. What is the relationship between your spine and the space around you? It's not optimal, correct? Try it the other way. It's like, oh, if I were to, so this is how you watch a beginner. They take too much weight on their head and they literally disconnect themselves from the lightness in the room, right? Because they're actually, and this is why chiropractors like work on your, on your neck and your top vertebrae a lot, right? Is because there's freedom there, right? So if I drop everything, it's like, wow, I'm not integrated with the space around me. That, see, I don't even like that. That takes my breath away. Does, anyone, does that take anyone else's breath away? Like I have a hard time breathing when I'm doing that wrong. So I'm going to like, whoa, that was like, I might have overshowed myself how that was a mistake. So I'm going to like go back to moving again because I did that too freaking well, right? I did the collapse of my zero gravity energy too well. Right. So how do you teach someone with a disability that they have zero gravity energy accessible to them within their nervous system? Hmm. Not really sure. Coming down again. I'm doing everything quick, more quickly without all my words. Hmm. Hmm. Where's the me part? Where's the me part that's a sensation and not a thought? That would be the difference between consciousness and ego. Good, and then release. Big space. Inverted space. Right. <clears throat> Grounded space. And now I'm going to go back to my legs and push on my legs because you're not going to balance in headstand without a sensation of grounding. Right. So, and remember, we're going to have to balance and hone balance when we're not upside down, right? So I'm getting this action again. I'm gonna come forward and make it strong. And so I'm gonna go into headstand arms, interlock my hands, have them on my thighs. And if I got zero gravity energy in my body somehow that I don't ever have to understand, and I wanna use my will in relationship to it, Right, so I'm forward, I'm extending, I'm dropping my shoulder blades, I'm lifting my chest. And I'm trying to pause my mind just enough to know that there's zero gravity potential in my body. And I'm gonna breathe. The empty spaces are not created by your mind. They make your mind possible. It's inverted. The mind, the human mind keeps thinking it's the source, right? It's the most important thing. Incorrect. It doesn't, it can sense the emptiness, 
doesn't create the emptiness. In fact, the emptiness creates the potential of the mind. And what's wild is that your mind can get injured. Right? Forward again. Your emptiness can get injured. Your access to your emptiness can get injured. Psychological injury. Don't think your mind creates the energy that makes it possible. It does not. Lift the chest and breathe. So, sit up straight and tall. Wait a minute, I can't believe it's quarter to 11 already. All right, we're going for a way longer today. We're not, but I'm gonna point like I'm gonna do that. Damn it, because I have a lot I wanna pass on right now. Right, so, does my body have imagination? Okay. I want you to take your arm over your head and touch the sky. We've done this before. And I want you to, by reaching, like, damn it, if I were just taller, damn it, if I could get that box from outside my front door in, if I could just freaking do it, I could actually touch the sky, right? Okay, I'm gonna do it with my other arm. I'm gonna touch it, I'm gonna go, if I just reach a little harder, if I drive myself a little bit harder, I could probably touch the sky if I could just be stretch your man in the Fantastic Four, right? Right? And I could leak all the way up there. And if I just try harder, I'll get there. That would be incorrect. That would be a failure of understanding and appreciating our transcendence. But now if I take my arms up, my arm up, I drop my shoulder blade, I find my sitting bones, I hit down through my sitting bones, drop my shoulder blade, start opening my, my palm and my fingertips, and let the grounding down go beyond my fingertips to the ceiling. Let's just do the ceiling first. Remember, I've asked you to touch trees from 20 feet before, right? I think I was asking you to imagine it with your mind. Oh, if I could just leave it with my mind and imagine touching a tree at the center of my chest. It's not how you do it. The body has imagination. It informs the mind. So as I ground and drop my shoulder blade and let my fingertips go beyond my fingertips, right? Through the grounding of the body, my mind starts to be able to see. Good, and then release. The body starts the imagination. Here's a contrast. I'm just gonna do it with my mind. Take your arm up, don't do any grounding, right? Now, now you're forced into mental imagination, right? Gotta kind of imagine where, the, close my eyes, crinkle my face. Imagine where the ceiling is, right? I'm just gonna use my mental imagination now. Now I'm gonna embody it. I'm gonna do everything I know about yoga. I'm gonna mentally imagine. Now I'm gonna embody it and let my body show my mind how to realize. Good, and then release. Well, yeah, I think the possibility of my imagination is rooted in my body. The ones that actually have energy touch. So can I hug a tree from 20 feet away? Not if I furrow my brows and mentally imagine. So when I learned how to invert the room, in an inversion, because I couldn't go upside down. <clears throat> I had to think back to when I was a kid. And it, some of you have done handstand on the floor know what I'm talking about, when you invert the room, right? Now, if I just think it's a mental gymnastics trick, the prana doesn't move. If I can actually 
invert the room. Because remember, in relationship to prana, it doesn't matter where your head is. One of the things that my paralyzed legs taught me, it told me where the hum was, not which way was up. The zero gravity energy in our, that's accessed by our nervous system doesn't have position. The, our orientation to prana is through practice, through being more upright than upside down. So I'm sitting here thinking, if I start lengthening my neck and lifting my sternum and dropping my sitting bones, and I use that to reach my head to the ceiling, and then I try to go, the ceiling is the floor, and I move in the other direction. I want to feel that in my, through my body, not by imagining it with my mind. I want to receive the world inverted, not invert it with my mind. Good, and then release. So the way I learned how to do it, right, was that I, I used to get in trouble from playing too much and breaking things in the house as a little kid. And I'd get in trouble and would kind of get the version of a timeout. And I'd lay on my back and look at the ceiling and think, God dang it, if I could just flip the house upside down, there wouldn't be any lamps for me to break. No vases, if I could run on the ceiling, I could do what I want to do and not break stuff and get in trouble. Hands up over your head. So I'm gonna do one arm at a time first, because I want this length. I wanna get the space between my elbow going towards the ceiling, which I'm gonna make the floor, and get space in my neck, right? Because the length in my neck, I know is a linchpin. If it collapses, I lose the zero gravity of empty space, right? So I wanna make sure that my arm goes up, my shoulder blade goes down and the back of my neck length, lengthens. Not just the back, the whole thing. And then I'm gonna do it on the other side, right? I'm gonna come forward on my sitting bones because when, I, when I'm back on my sitting bones, I collapse in my other parts of my spine. So I'm gonna come forward and get, and I, I can't hold forward and do this step with my arm on this side because of my scoliosis. So I'm coming forward, but I'm really trying to make sure that this space stays long, right? And the elbow in, why? Because out here, the angle into my spine isn't as fluid as if my elbow's in. And now I'm gonna lengthen from the armpit to the elbow, drop the shoulder blades, lift my chest. Then I'm gonna remember, that the ceiling, my brain, my mind makes it my orientation be this way. I'm gonna to try to receive the ceiling to my forearm. Receive it, not imagine it. Good, and then release again. In, lengthen, lengthen the neck, lengthen the spine. If my spine collapses in an inversion, it's not gonna be an inversion. Zero gravity is not gonna be realized. Now I'm again, I'm not reaching for the ceiling. I'm bringing it down by lengthening my spine. I bring the ceiling down to my forearm. Good, and then release. Now, I don't know about you. Is anyone sweating like crazy? I'm sweating like crazy. This has been hard work. This hasn't been hard. I've missed my teaching mark. Now, once I do both arms, right, my spine collapses. So I'm sitting there as a yogi going, okay, 
If I lean forward with both arms up, I wobble, and that can't be an inversion. Stability has to be part of an inversion. So I'm gonna have to adjust from sensation first, not to how I imagine the asana is supposed to go. So I'm gonna lean back in the back of my chair, get my chest more open this way, then take my arms up. And now I'm gonna look back like I'm hanging my head off the edge of the bed like I did as a little kid, right? And so if you, if you yeah, so Jane, you gotta figure out how to adjust. You know, it doesn't matter if your arms are over your head. You can do one arm over your head, right? But here I'm back like this. And now I'm using the back of my chair to start some of the upside down energy. Now, oh my goodness, I've got to start doing everything else, right? And remember, the direction of the zero gravity, which seems like a misnomer, right? Zero gravity doesn't seem like it has direction. The inversion is showing you potential because you're moving energy from your top of your head, above your head, down through your feet. So as I'm going back, dropping my shoulder blades, lengthening this arm, making the space in my neck, tipping back over the back of my chair, which there's a kink in my back, I can feel it. So I'm gonna tip back even more. I'm gonna slant back even more, right? Cause I can feel that I'm not quite there. And now I'm gonna ground. I'm gonna remember the feeling of the table on my forearms. I'm gonna use my memory, which is prana. Memory is the mark of prana backwards in time, right? So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get the table there. I'm gonna drop my shoulder blades. And now I'm gonna learn to hit down through my sitting bones, extend from my inner groin to my inner knee down to my inner heel. So in this upside down position where I'm actually starting to look at the ceiling if I can, right? I'm gonna to try to hit down towards to the floor. Use my will this way as I open this way. So this might be a little disorienting for some of you, so stop. Don't push yourself too far. So, and then release. One more thing. Well, I got like 17 more things. But, <clears throat> so, Shit, got four minutes, okay. Lean forward, don't be doing this upside down stuff. Remember I said there's an expansion on inhalation and a sender grounding on exhalation. And that when I exhale, my shoulder blades drop, energy goes down towards the earth, even as my chest lifts. Get that sense again, that like focusing that happens on exhalation. And it's a downward thing that creates the extension up. So I expand on inhalation. I exhale even more focused because I, so I let it vibrate like Ujjayi breath that some of you know, right? And I go down as my chest lifts. Okay. Thumbs up if you have any idea what I'm talking about on exhalation, taught this a lot this last few months, okay? I wanna do that when I'm upside down. I wanna get the energy moving this way through from my head to my feet, right? And I'm gonna engage my breath in a different way. Here I go back, up, over, in, trying to get this open, trying to keep space. I'm not tipped back enough, right? <clears throat> I'm going to start seeing the ceiling. I'm going to lengthen this way to send energy this way. I'm going to raise my chest and drop my shoulder blades to send energy this way. Then I'm going to inhale. And on the exhalation, I'm going to lengthen my neck, lengthen the energy of my spine downward to rise it up. Couple more times. 
I'm not going to forget that the ceiling's the floor. My mind wants to resist. Good, and then release. <clears throat> so the paradox is that my mind, you, we tend to think that I need to imagine stuff. No, my mind resists letting my orientation to the prana not have a set pattern. So it's not that my imagination fails, right? It's that my mind resists, right? And this is what's hard about, about prana. Everything's relative. Your body's position is relative to prana. Right, like it doesn't matter where your body is. And this is what Austin is trying to show you. So this is, that's a really hard thought. So lean forward, ground your forearms again. Let's do a more controlled version of headstand here without the upside down stuff. So I'm lifting my chest, I'm dropping my shoulder blades, I'm feeling my forearms on the table. I'm interlocking my fingers. I'm lengthening my neck. I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff. So I'm doing, especially through my torso, I'm doing everything I would do in headstand. Now I'm gonna hit down through my sitting bones, extend from the inner groin down to the inner knee down to my feet. I'm gonna take a different set of arms and put them in headstand over my head, not my physical arms. I'm going to do this while I'm doing this. And I'm going to see the pattern, the movement from lengthening my neck, lifting my chest to down to my sitting bones, from the inner groin to the inner knee and down to my feet. Now I'm gonna use my breath in a way that accentuates the pattern. Then I'm gonna take the outside of my mouth and bring it up towards my ears. Because the world's miraculous way more than my imagination can see. Good, and then release. Prepare for Shavasana. If you gotta go, you gotta go. I missed my mark on this class and time, right? But if you have the time to stay on for Shavasana, please do, right? Because this, I am like fatigued from this class, right? It was hard to talk and do it, right? So I want to set up myself, and I think it's got to, if it's this hard for me to do, it must have been hard if you're doing it, right? So I'm going to find a place for me to take the support from my chair. I'm not going to worry that my relationship to prana is arbitrary in the function of habit, but I'm seeing it in Shavasana. Because relief comes into the pores in every direction. Right? Soften the skin on your, gotta get the brain out of this, the, the mind habit out of this. So soften your forehead, the skin, and the temples and the jaw, and the inside of the mouth. We're trying to free your consciousness from mind habit. Let the chair hold you up. Transform the emptiness. Let it first be relief. And then Let it be a gra gratitude. 
and a smile. Start to bring yourself back. Slightly deeper inhalation. Slightly longer exhalation. I find myself wanting to really gently move my head so my neck opens again. That feels right to you, do it. When you're ready, open your eyes. So, for me, the realization, these are just fancy words, that, that part of my energy lives in zero gravity. And that requires me to embody, not disembody is incredibly empowering. Right, that, so I can't bring that box in. It's not just that I know who I am, I know what I am. So I'm going to pause here for a second and feel as I come out of a class like that. Then I hear that whisper, king and queen of all the asanas. So I've heard that headstand is a balancing pose that hones one's concentration. Kind of makes sense. If I judge how I feel right now. Huh. Shoulder stands a different sensation. My relationship to prana is mind habit. Gotta figure like a monkey isn't as scared as swinging through the trees. It's not just that they have skill, they have a different mind habit. They're not thinking about the fall, right? All right, everybody. Weird stuff, but when it when you think of back to the words of this class, come forward and ground. And if that shavasana, if you got tired from this class, do a longer shavasana. Take care of yourself. <laughs>